Lynn Hiles Ministries presents Dr. Lynn Hiles, That You Might Have Life. And here's your host, Dr. Lynn Hiles. Welcome back to the program again today as we start our second uh, program on Gideon. We're, go- we're talking about Gideon, and we've been filming for some time a series on the book of Judges. I trust you've been watching because I think this is such a powerful study to me and, and just so gives me so uh, much uh, ability to communicate some things that I believe the Lord wants to say to His people uh, concerning this. And uh, if you've been watching, what we, what we have uh, shared has been uh, kind of a picture of the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. Now, let me just say this to you again before I even get into the message, because if you tune in for the first time, and you're a little bit lost, but you like to say, hey, I'd like to go back and listen to this whole series. Uh, it is available to you on our YouTube channel. And we're encouraging people to go there and watch the YouTube channel because you can watch it on demand. You can pause it. You can take notes. Uh, you can share it in a, uh, a, a cell group or a Bible study. Uh, you can do all kinds of stuff with it, uh, and it's there available. And the easiest way to do that is to go to my website, At lynnhiles.com, of course, the information is right on the screen there that you can see, or it will come up on the screen. And it will take you directly to our website. In our website, in the upper right-hand corner, there are icons that will take you to the YouTube channel. There's a picture of the YouTube. There's a little Android thing there that you can click and go to, take you to our podcast on Android, and also one for uh, your iPhone. If you just simply click on it, it will take you directly there. While you're there, you might want to think about picking up some of our books or products as Christmas gifts to people who enjoy getting books for Christmas. We've got From Law to Grace is available. We've got the Revelation of Jesus Christ on there, the second edition that's available. We've got the book titled Unforced Rhythms of Grace. that will be a great blessing to you. And my latest book is titled The Great I Am. And uh, they make great stocking stuffers or even some of the series that we have that are available to you there. And you can go there and avail yourself to that and be able again to watch. If you sign up and subscribe to my YouTube channel, you will get a notification when we are uploading a new program. And it costs you nothing to do that. We are doing this because our partners have allowed us to be able to broadcast on this level and they are paying the bill for that. Now, if you'd like to become a partner, of course, we welcome that, but uh, that's not required in order to watch our YouTube stuff. All right, let's get back in the Word to this morning, or this evening, and let me just share this with you. Uh, again, we shared how uh, the book of Joshua opens by saying, now Moses, my servant, is dead. Arise now, Joshua, and get ready to take the people into the Promised Land. We showed you how the book of Joshua is a picture of moving from Moses to Jesus. Now, remember, the word Joshua is the Hebrew name Yeshua. It is the English name we translate Jesus. And so, when you see the book of Joshua, it is a powerful Old Testament picture of what it takes to move from law to grace, or if you will, from the bondage of Egypt into the promised land. And that's because Moses can bring you out, but only Joshua or Yeshua, or Jesus can bring you in. And Moses brought you out with a rod, but Yeshua brings you in with a mercy seat. Then we came over to the book of Judges, and we show you that the next book consecutive to that one is the book of Judges. And it starts out by saying, now after the death of Joshua, or say it like this, now after the death of Yeshua, or after the death of Jesus. And so after the death of Jesus, what happens? Well, the book of Judges is about what was exacted in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is another powerful Old Testament picture of redemption of what happens after the death of Yeshua or after the death of Jesus. And I think it is an incredible parallel that in the New Testament, after the death of Jesus, that uh, He hands the kingdom to 12 apostles and says to them, you will settle on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And I believe it is their gospel that the 12 tribes were judged by. 
And so when you come into the book of Judges then, the parallel to that, he hands the judgment to 12 judges. And what is amazing to me, and I can't, I can't say this enough, but these are ordinary people with human flaws and human weaknesses, people just like you and I that are struggling maybe sometimes with stuff. But he gives them authority, and he raises up judges who will execute, or if you will, enforce a judgment that was accomplished on Calvary's tree through the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, I think it's incredible, again, that we see that, you know, uh, that those powerful pictures, but when we shared with you the key, one of the key scriptures, and I'm going to keep on hammering this, is out of Psalm chapter 149, where he said, Sing unto the Lord a new song. The new song is found in Revelation, the fifth chapter, when it says, And they sang, as it were, a new song, saying, Thou hast redeemed us. And so the song that's the new song is not just the newest song that some group wrote, but it's the new song of the new covenant. And it is the song of redemption, what we have been redeemed from. But sometimes we don't, first of all, know what we've been redeemed from, from sin, from sickness, from poverty, and from death. And we don't realize what we've been redeemed from. And so these enemies plunder us just like they did Israel. And as I shared with you, especially in the last segment, when they got ready to go in and take the land, they did not completely do what God told them to do. He told them to get rid of all the people of this land, and they did not do that. So as a result, he says that what's going to happen is what you did not conquer is going to come back to conquer you, or there are going to be thorns in your sides. And it would start out in chapter 1 and 2 of Judges by saying Manasseh did not completely drive out this people, and Ephraim did not completely drive out these people because they paid tribute to them. In other words, they had something to gain by not driving out some of these areas of their territory, and these same tribes came back to be a thorn in their sight or to conquer them. And the thought that I had was, what are you willing to live with? Sometimes we're willing to live with some stuff that becomes a plunder to us. And last week, as we started, and we'll start here again in the book of Judges, uh, in chapter 6 with Gideon, this, we're going to jump right back in here. In verse number 1, Judges 6 says, Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord delivered him to the hand of Midian for seven years, and the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel. Because of the Midianites and the children of Israel made for themselves dens, the dens, the caves, and the strongholds which are in the mountains. So it was whenever Israel had sown, the Midianites would come up also, the Amalekites and the people of the east would come up against them, and they would encamp against them and destroy the produce of the earth as far as Gaza and leave no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep nor ox nor donkey. For they would come up with their livestock and their tents coming in as numerous as locusts, both they and their camels were without number, and they would enter the land to destroy it. So Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites, and the children of Israel cried to the Lord. And it came to pass that when the children of Israel cried out to the Lord because of the Midianites, the Lord sent a prophet to them, the children of Israel, who said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you out of the house of bondage, and I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all who oppressed you, drove them out before you, and gave you their land. Also I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under a ter terebinth tree, which was in Oprah, which belonged to Joash the Adversarite, while his son Gideon threshed wheat in the winepress in order to hide it from the Midianite. Now, let me just stop for a moment. What happened was, because they allowed these enemies to remain in their land. Now, before you start thinking this is political, or this is about what's going on in the Middle East right now, and some of that, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about how sometimes we're willing to live with some things that God wants us to overcome. In other words, we give place to some stuff that we really need to drive out. I, I still believe there is this abundance of grace 
and this gift of righteousness, watch this, so that we can reign in life by one Christ Jesus. So reigning in life, to me, begins to talk about how we can have dominion over areas of our life that have conquered us and that keep us from being fruitful. Remember, they destroyed the produce of the land and left them impoverished. I believe sometimes we've been left in spiritual deficits because we have allowed some things to creep into our lives where we need to overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. Now, I believe Jesus conquered everything. But when we understand what the, that this book of Judges is not about you trying to get the victory on the basis of your human strength, but you're enforcing a judgment that was already exacted at the cross when Jesus said, now is the judgment of this world come, now is the prince of this world judge, and I, if I be lifted up, will draw all men unto myself. And I think he's including men there, but I think he's also including all judgment. He took what I had coming so I could get what he has coming, but when you read the book of Psalms, which is one of the key verses that we have used in sharing this series on the book of Judges, where it says, Sing unto the Lord a new song, it's the song of redemption. But the last verse of that says, This honor have all of his saints to execute the judgment written. So when I'm thinking about executing the judgment written, I'm not talking about calling down fire from heaven and destroying everybody. I'm talking about enforcing what Jesus paid for and standing in faith to see it manifest in our lives so that we no longer remain impoverished or unfruitful. And that's not just in the gifts of the Spirit or, and, and, uh, and, and, and money, but being uh, fully equipped with the fruit of the Spirit and the supply that brings us love, joy, peace, long-suffering, generous, goodness, meekness, temperance against such there is no law. And I think that if you will understand that the reality of it is, is that there is such a need for us to put an emphasis on fruit. I think sometimes we put a great emphasis on the gifts of the Spirit, but we've got a lot of people moving in the gifts of the Spirit that don't have any fruit of the Spirit. And I think it's incredible, and I probably shouldn't even chase this rabbit a little bit here, but on the garment of the high priest, when he would walk uh, into the tabernacle on his garment, there was on the, on the hem of his garment a bell, and a pomegranate, a bell and a pomegranate. Every other one, every between every bell, there was a pomegranate. And what that speaks to me of is the bells speak of the gifts of the Spirit, and the pomegranates speak of the fruit of the Spirit. But if you have gifts of the Spirit, you have bells, and you don't have any pomegranates, or you don't have any fruit, then those bells would clang together and make a noise. I think that's probably what Paul was alluding to when he says, if you have gifts of prophesying tongues, speaking tongues more than you are, and, in all, and don't have charity, you're a tinkling cymbal and a sounding brass. In other words, the bells are clanging against each other because there's no fruit. I like to say it like this. If you have all gifting and no fruit, you are a ding-a-ling. <laughs> in other words, you're just making a lot of racket. But I believe that the Holy Spirit is raising up a people who are going to begin to walk in what belongs to them and take their possession and possess it. And sometimes I think that, that, that just, that's what he was telling them in Joshua, the book of Joshua. Go possess it. You got to dispossess. You got to dis what's dis in you. And you heard me teach that back some time ago. You got to dis disappointment. You got to dis uh, disillusionment. You got to dis uh, disease because uh, you're at ease. Uh, you got an appointment. In other words, you got to dis what's dis in you. In other words, stop claiming ownership to some things that really is not who you are in your new nature. We need to begin to arise and apply the finished work of Jesus Christ on every level so that we're no longer plundered and we're no longer taken advantage of because of our enemies. And what God does is in the middle of that is the people of God begin to cry out to him. Now, I'm not saying God sends the judgment because I believe his judgment is complete. But these judgment that we see, are the, these, these enemies that we see in the book of Judges are because they failed to drive these issues out. And so it's kind of like even under grace. I don't believe we're under the wrath of God or the judgment of God. I believe Jesus took all of that on himself, and that's what, what happened in the new covenant that's different than the old covenant is he was judged in my place. But I do believe there are still repercussions to our actions and that we reap 
what we sow many times. Now, I, I believe that there are things that, that happens in our lives and we cry out to God, but it's not God who sent it. Let me just be clear about that. These are enemies. It was not God who sent it. It was the repercussions in the new covenant to our actions. So what are we going to do? Are we going to decide to be like the children of Israel and say, well, I'm just willing to live with this. I'm willing to live with this discouragement. I'm willing to live with this depression. I'm willing to live with this disease. I'm willing to live with this poverty. Or am I going to rise up and say, what is it that I can do that can execute or enforce what Jesus already paid for because he was wounded for my transgressions. He was bruised for my iniquities. He became uh, poor so that I could become rich. In other words, he took everything I had coming so I could get what he has coming. But you don't get it by sitting there just saying, oh, whatever will be, will be. If God wants me to have it, he'll let me have it. I, I believe you've got to take faith and believe God, not because believing Him creates it, but because it, believing Him gives you access to what's already been paid for. So the faith is what causes us to arise and appropriate by faith what was freely provided by grace. Now, I think it's interesting that as we start in, on down here, even with Gideon, it said that the angel of the Lord appeared. Let me grab it here and, and said, and uh, it says, so... Uh, let me, and I said, so now the, this is verse 11. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth tree, which is in Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abazarite. And while his son Gideon threshed wheat in the winepress in order to hide it from the Midianites. Now, see, I told you as we started to study the book of Judges that everything these people did in the visible realm was a picture of the redemptive work of Christ. Well, we start out here with Gideon, and here we have wheat and a wine press. Now, anybody that follows my teaching has heard me talk about bread and wine because bread and wine always symbolizes the finished work of Jesus Christ. It always symbolizes an entrance, an abundant entrance into the everlasting kingdom of God and into the new covenant because the night before his decease, Jesus said to his disciples in an upper room, with great desire have I desired to eat this Passover with you. And he took the bread and he blessed the bread and then he broke it and then he gave them the cup also and said, this cup is my blood of the new covenant. This do in remembrance of me as often as you come together. And so when you go over into the New Testament uh, later on where Paul takes that bread, he said, and we being many are one bread. But first of all, I want you to see before we become one bread, we've got to partake of the bread. We've got to partake of the wine. We've got to partake of, if you will, the finished work of Jesus Christ. So what they were trying to do here with Gideon was take his Say it like this, they were taking his revelation of the finished work and robbing him because all he's doing is what many people today and many of the circles even that I preach in are eking out just enough of a living dealing with and feeding on the finished work of Jesus Christ just for them and theirs. You know, a lot of people, when I started teaching this series, I said, you know, a lot of people know what they've been saved from, but they don't know what they've been saved for. And so we are not just saved so we can consume this upon our own and just feed me and mine and my handful. But God wants to raise up a people who are going to be able to uh, defeat some enemies until there's bread and wine for everybody. And some of these enemies are religious traditions and losing mentalities that have been the things that have robbed us of the provision that you see uh, that these Midianites were robbing them of. And if, if you remember last week when I was talking, it said they came upon the people and they were as many as grasshoppers. And what I showed you last week is that these grasshoppers are symbols of losing mentalities. You say, well, where did you get that from? Well, I got it from the book of Joshua. When the 10 spies went in and said, hey, do you know how big the walls are? There are giants in the land. The sons of Anak are there. And these guys are six toes and six fingers on every, you know, on every hand and every orifice. And so what happens is they're, they're like, uh, you know, we are so, we were grasshoppers in our own sight. So were we in theirs. That's what the 10 spy says. I think the number 10 is the number that speaks of law. So if you're under law and legalism, it's always telling you what's wrong with you and who you're not. 
and why you can't have this and why you're disqualified. And the reason this has happened is because you you did this and you did, and, and it puts all the focus back on you. And the first thing you know, people sit in church their whole lives and don't even feel worthy to get a headache healed, or we leave with such a lack of, of, of identity and self-esteem that we don't feel like we fit anywhere, so we kind of hide off like, you know, uh, we're second-rate citizens. And we believed lies because we've listened to the majority, which was the ten spies, rather than the two who went into the land and didn't come back and say, hey, you all know how big the enemy is? They didn't come back preaching the enemy. They came back and said, the fruit there there's grapes the size of pumpkins. We had to carry it on a staff between us, and, and we are well able to take the land. But because they came back with evil reports coming from the wrong covenant, Joshua and Caleb came back with a different spirit. They were looking at a completely different thing. They didn't have a losing mentality. They had a victorious uh, a view of things. And so what was happening was that God said, because you've listened to these 10 spies, you're going to spend another 40 years wandering around until this generation dies off. I don't know about you, but man, I am in my 60s now, and I believe I'm part of a Joshua generation. As a matter of fact, God spoke to me about three or four years ago, and he said to me, you are going to be one who helps lead a generation into the fullness of what it means to live in the promised land. And I refuse to preach a losing Jesus. I refuse to preach a gospel of defeat. I want to declare that Jesus' victory won some things, and that the first thing you need to do is get Get rid of some of these losing mentalities, some of these locusts that enter in to, make, to impoverish us, both spiritually, physically, and on every level. And then I shared with you last week how in the book of Joel, he says that, uh, he says that the, the, the gnawing locust came. If you read it in the Amplified Bible, it says it like this. The gnawing locust came. Uh, then, then, then the cr crawling locust, and then the hopping locust, and then the flying locust. And I begin to think about these losing mentalities. They don't start out flying. They start out gnawing and then crawling and then hopping and then airborne. And the first thing you know, man, you're full of fear. And then as the result, the book of Joel says, because of that, the corn, the wine, and the oil were impoverished and they were in a famine and the, and the oxen and the cattle were lowing because the garners were empty. There was no, there was a famine because of these locusts. I believe we live sometimes impoverished spiritually because we're preaching from the wrong covenant, the 10 spies that came and we're listening to them with their losing mentalities and we are believing what they're saying, and it is impoverishing the people of God, and we are living way below the standard of which God wants us to live. But I'm thankful that he raises up a Gideon who might have been hiding wheat under the wine press, but is going to come and see restoration. I then took you uh, to the, Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, where the Bible said that John the Baptist came preaching, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and it said his meat was locust. Look at this. His meat was locust and wild honey. The man was a bug eater. The message of the kingdom and the message that the kingdom of God is not just where you go when you die, but it is at hand because the king of that kingdom was about to walk down over the bank of the Jordan River in the gospel of Matthew. And the real Joshua, Yeshua, is now on the scene. Uh, the bugs are going to have to be eaten. Somebody's going to have to destroy these locusts. His meat, John the Baptist's message of repent, change the way you think. That's what repentance means. It's the Greek word metanoia. Is what will eat the bugs, if you will, those, these losing mentalities, is when we start to repent and change the way we think, and then his meat was also wild honey. In other words, once you get rid of the losing mentalities, the wild honey speaks of, to me of what flows from the promised land. They were milk. It was a land of milk that flows with milk and honey. Milk is a symbol of righteousness in the scripture because he says if you need milk, it's because you're not exercised in the word of righteousness. So milk and honey are promised land sustenance and supply. And that, ladies and gentlemen, has been in great 
if you will, uh, impoverishment because very few of the church seem to grab a hold of the fact that we were given righteousness as a free gift and abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness we reign in life. And so the more we preach who you are in Christ, the more we begin to rise up like Gideon and say, you know what, I've been threshing wheat, hiding it under the wine press. And I've been getting enough for me and mine, but I believe God wants to raise up a company of people who are going to begin to see the famine turned around and a great abundance come. And that's going to come as we start to believe what God said. Because if you remember Gideon, he let's go on down through here and we'll get this started in this one and perhaps pick it up in the next one. It said, and the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, the Lord is with you, mighty man of valor. Now see there, once again, we're seeing this mentality that I'm nobody and I'm, 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 you know, the Holy Spirit says, you're a mighty man of valor. And Gideon said to him, oh, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his miracles, which our fathers told us about? Saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Then the Lord turned to him and said, go in this your might of yours, and you will save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? And he said, oh, my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, Surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. Now, I'm not going to be able to get all this in this segment, but we're going to come back again and keep on digging in this. But he listened. He, in other words, his view of himself was, I'm the least of my father's house, and I'm the weakest in my clan, and I'm the least in my father's house. But that's not what God was saying. He finds this man who's in a spiritual impoverishment. And when you get sick and tired of being sick and tired, something will rise up in you and God will begin to maybe raise you up as a deliverer. An ordinary person, remember these are ordinary people doing extraordinary things. And God will keep on saying to you, you are a mighty man of valor. There's more in you than you can imagine. And if you'll arise and begin to listen to what God, and God will keep on speaking it to you and say, man, I am going to use people just like you who think you're the least in their father's house as a deliverer to bring God's people into blessing, fullness, and overflow. Well, we're about to run out of time again today. And so if you would just take a moment to uh, call the number on the screen and sow a seed into the ministry or to go to the website at lynnhiles.com and there's a place where you can give there via credit card or debit card and you can set up a monthly debit if you'd like to become a monthly partner or you can give a one-time gift. But we do need your help to continue to do this or you can send a check or money order to the address that will come on the screen. But do it today because we need your help. God bless you. Join us next week again. I am excited to announce the release of my latest book titled The Great I Am. In this book, we will explore the seven times in the Gospel of John that Jesus says, I am. When he uses that phrase, it is always in contrast to something from the Old Covenant. For instance, they thought Moses and the law was the door into the sheepfold, but Jesus said to them, I am the door. They thought that Israel was the true vine, but Jesus said to them, I am the vine, you are the branches. As you read the pages of this book, you will discover that Jesus removed the covenant of death and replaced it with the covenant of life. Get your copy of the book, The Great I Am, today.